Today's show is brought to you by Maitland & Co. Solicitors and Notaries. Now, of course, we hope that you never need to avail yourselves of legal services, but unfortunately, life isn't like that. And Maitland & Co. are specialists in criminal defence and road traffic law, and they come highly recommended from heart and hand. They cover all over Scotland, and they deal with all types of criminal cases, including road traffic law. They appear in Justice of the Peace, Sheriff and High Courts. They are on call 24-7, because... Because unfortunately you're never going to know when you're going to need a lawyer and they are available 24-7 for police station interviews, prison visits, legal aid is available, competitive rates if applicant is not eligible for legal aid and first interview is free. Maitland & Co. have represented fans charged under the offensive behaviour at football legislation. So, if you ever need legal counsel, the best place to go is Maitland & Co. Get in touch with them at info at maitlandandco.net. That's info at maitland, M-A-I-T-L-A-N-D and co.net. 07714615845 07714615845 That's info at maitlandandco.net 07714615845 For all your criminal defence needs Hello folks and welcome to Heart and Hand Extra The second weekly pod from us here at Heart and Hand Thank you very much for joining us My name is David Edgar and I am your host Now as longer term listeners will know We have a bit of an international week tradition on here Where we ask you guys to send in questions And I answer them in the imaginatively but accurately titled International Week Q&A And as usual you have responded In significant numbers and enough to make sure That I can't just get the night off So thank you for that Uh, Always delighted when that happens Uh, Right well we might as well just get straight into it then And the first question comes from Greg Cunningham Who used the hashtag HHpod on Twitter If you ever have a question for us that's the place to go Because it means that it stays there forever Until I go and find it He said uh Out of the podders, who is the biggest pervert? I'd say Hoggy runs Scott very close. Uh, I'd say Hoggy wins. Uh, Scott is, if you like, a a, a voyeuristic pervert. He's aware of a large number of perversions, but I doubt very much that uh, he's ever had sexual intercourse in anything other than a regular Presbyterian lights-out missionary position, don't talk after, during, before, any of that sort of thing, only for procreation type love life, whereas Hoggy, I dread to think where he's been, uh, how he got there, what he did when he was in there, and when he left. I, I think that he he would definitely count as a, our biggest natural pervert. Uh, I don't even think it's close. Although Alex, I don't know why, I think it might be the scraggly beard. You know, he's just he's, he's got a look about him, but uh, I don't want to comment too much because Alex actually dates a, a good friend of mine. And uh, she's far too much of a lady to reveal anything like that. Unless I get drunk. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. I'll come up with something. Next up uh, is a question from Gordon Price. He said, if not Marty, who would your preference be? Well, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd be going for someone like, I mentioned this the other day, a Frank De Boer or a Giovan Bronckhorst. Or if we had more money, then you would be looking at maybe coaches in England. But... Uh, there's a guy at Sheffield United, Chris Wilder, who I think has been doing well, but I don't know if the fans would have would would necessarily accept that after Warburton, even though I think this guy's got potential to be a lot better of manager. But as I've said before, I don't really like this argument that people put up when you say, they, I'm not sure about Marty, they go, oh, well, who would you have then? And you're like, well, it's not really my job to know that. Um it's kind of the, the chief executive in the football people. I don't know one who's applied. I don't know who's available. I don't know what the budget is. I haven't had talks with any of them to see what sort of conditions they would need in terms of finances available to them if they were to take the job. So I don't think that fans have to be responsible for coming up with a name because you can say something and then people say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, How do you know it's ridiculous? We don't know what the circumstances are and we don't know what the the availability of managers is like. That's why you have a chief executive. That's why you have a director of football. That's their role to to come up with a manager. But, I mean, I think if you could get someone like Frank De Boer, who's got that international reputation, he's got a track record of success. Unfortunately, of course, his last two jobs haven't gone well, but then I don't think he would be a realistic option if they had. So 
X Rangers would never hurt, uh, and and he would excite me. Uh, the counter to that, and I've heard some people say it, is that he's more of a project guy rather than an immediate short term success person. But I don't know who will come in and get. You hope any manager that we get in will bring short term success, but uh, I think it it's unrealistic to appoint someone by that criteria to say right. Well, he's the he's the first choice manager because he'll immediately bring success. You hope they do. But all managers will tell you that they require X amount of time to try and to to try and build up the side in their image and whatnot. And it usually takes two or three windows for them to get the, the team that they want. It's funny, on the Patreon site we do a show called The Advocate Years, and although Dick did win the treble in, in his first year, the difference between his team in the first six months and then the first six months of the following season, and of course there were no windows back then, so he was tinkering with it all through the season, but only two summer signings in summer 1999, and one of whom a damn trick was clearly just a squad player. That's the kind of thing managers do, that they, they build team up over a period of time till they get something that they're really happy with. Of course, Dick then went mental in the summer of 2000 and completely dismantled this excellent team he'd built, but that's uh, that's for another another episode. So yeah, I, I think that there will be candidates out there who are appealing. Uh, I think that in Scotland we have a tendency to maybe not look past the, the end of our noses in terms of, you know, who's the immediate candidates, and that's why you hear Steve Clark and obviously Derek McInnes was one that was mentioned basically because they are local and we can see them. Um, Counter-argument to that is I really don't want the board coming up with a Pedro Mark II, which I don't think they will. I think they've been scarred by that experience, as as we all kind of have, unfortunately. So I'm interested to see what happens with it. At this point, as I say, Graham Murty, I think it's very much in the balance, but it's gone backwards and forwards. I've gone backwards and forwards personally on it, as in thinking, yeah, he's definitely making progress and then to thinking, is he going to make progress quickly enough? I do have concerns about Graham Murty that he may be the, the right man at the wrong time. And sometimes in life, as I'm sure you all know, timing is as much a part of success as all the other factors. I don't doubt he's a hard worker. I don't doubt he's an intelligent man. And I actually do really believe he's going to be a successful manager somewhere one day I, 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 Hundred percent, I believe that it's just whether or not the circumstances at Ibrox allow that to happen just now. Um, but that's for the board to decide. And then once they've made a decision, incidentally, I'll back it hundred percent. You won't hear me um, complaining and moaning about it, even if I have misgivings. I think you know I've got right behind Warburton, got right behind Pedro, got right behind Ali for a long time, um, and that's just what we do. You know, that whoever is the guy in charge, we will get behind him. We might moan to our mates about it, but we'll we'll get behind him. And if it's Graham Murty and they give us the reasons, then that's what we'll do. You don't really have any other choice. But at the moment, I don't know if it is going to be him. I think that at the moment the board are starting, I get the impression the board are starting to ramp up their efforts to talk to other managers and to find out who is available should they need to make a decision in the summer. Kinda said from the start that I felt he had to he had to do something big to get the job. And it looked as though he was gonna for a wee while there, but momentum stalled a little bit. It's not to say it can't be recaptured. Absolutely it's not. Uh I do think that if he won the Scottish Cup it would be very difficult to not give him the job. I really do. And I understand that there'll be those of you who are listening right now who are saying, but David, you know, he's either the right man or he's not, and that shouldn't matter. And that is true. But again, I go back to the reality of the situation that if he gets knocked out in the semi final and uh, finishes second, I, I don't think that'll be enough for him. And if he does any worse than that, then it certainly won't be enough for him. But it would be great if he did deliver that success and made his appointment a formality um, because I, I do really think he's a, a very decent guy and he's got a lot of potential as a manager uh, like I say I just worry that it's maybe not right at the moment a uh, question from A Rixon 111 where do you see the club both on and off the field uh, on and off the park sorry in the next 5 to 10 years I don't do that um, I, I, I think that anyone in life who tells you that they've got a 5 year or 10 year plan uh, that's nice 
uh, I always use as a, a metaphor. You get that a lot in job interviews. You know, where do you see yourself in five years? How the fuck do I know? The world might have ended by then. And I think you just need to look at what happened to Rangers over the last 10 years, for an example. Um, plans, uh, I think, are nice. And, you know, they're, they're useful to have if you like, a vision of where you want to go and then you put into place a strategy and how you're going to get there. But you can't realise... I don't know what European football is going to look like in five to ten years. You know, the, we've seen with the Champions League now basically closing its doors to anyone who's not from the big five leagues that you you may start to see things like league breakaways, like Atlantic leagues, etc. You never know in Scottish football, given the standard of people running it, what utter debacle might be around the corner. Um uh, like I say, I go back, I had a mate who, uh, with his first kid, he had got really into it. Um, he's one of these modern parent type fellows. Yes, he does have a beard. And he had drawn up this buffing plan and, you know, him and his wife were agreed. And he went into the hospital and he handed it to midwife and said, I wanted to do this and do that. And she looked at it and laughed and went, this is all lovely, son, but there's a baby in there that hasn't read any of it. And he's coming out one way or another. And that's kind of what I think your know, plans, long-term plans of five to ten years in such a reactive industry are like. Uh, what will happen will happen. Um, so no, I don't. I don't really look that far ahead. To be to be honest with you, the famous Bears. Do you think that Rangers are getting the right balance between signing players and promoting youth from within? Do you think this will continue into the future? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think so. We're in a unique position of having to have. It come back from you know the weakest place in our history to try and get back to the place that we've traditionally occupied throughout our history. Um, we also have to take into account things like the way football is, the money being concentrated in certain leagues and we're not one of them. And we have to accept that because of the unattractiveness of our league that attracting top players, even if we did have the money, which we don't, is a non-starter. So you have to sign intelligently, and I think there have been signs of that after some disastrous transfer windows. I think that the one we we had in January, regardless of how the season might might um, eventually end up, I think good players were brought in, sensible signings, sensible fees. We have brought through, you know, one exceptional young player in Ross McCrory. You've got David Bates is developing as well. Uh, there's also a, a, a lot of promising guys like Aidan Wilson, uh, Serge Atakai, those type of players. Jamie Barjonis has seen a bit of first-team action this season. So I think we do have the balance okay at the moment. And the thing about signings is you're, you always get the balance right if the team's winning. <laughs> it's as simple as that. If the team is winning and... You you are still actively bringing through young players, which Rangers clearly do attempt to. Then you can see that Rangers are are keen to to do that and balance it out with sensible signings. I mean, if we could have a team that entirely came through from Hawking Howie, that would be fantastic. That's obviously Nirvana, but uh, it's unlikely. And given the the clamour that will always exist around Rangers for success now rather than jam tomorrow then you're going to need to always augment your squad with experienced players or with talented players in the case of Greg Doherty so yeah I mean I I, I think we've got the balance right I think there's a path to the first team for youngsters I, I don't think you know when I was growing up in the the sort of late 80s early 90s Rangers just didn't really bring through young players it just didn't happen and I could understand at the time where maybe younger younger talented players were going, I'm not going to sign for them because I'm never going to play for them. This way, I'm better going off and proving myself somewhere else. And I don't think that's the case now. I think opportunities do exist if you're good enough to get into the side. I think fans are receptive to it. If you look at the way Ross McCrory has been embraced to everybody's hearts. Equally, you know, we can be a little too critical of youngsters, and I've spoke about that before on here. Uh, about David Bates, you know, five, six games and people saying he's pissed, you'll never make it. Six games, you know, I mean, we've got to be a little more patient with them. But overall, I think we're doing okay. You see the investment and in the youth development side of it. You see the, the hiring of new coaches like uh, my close personal friend, Kevin Thompson and Gregory Vignal um, and other people who are coming in who've got experience of being winners, never mind being good coaches on top of that. So, 
yeah, I, I'm quite happy with the way things are going. It's probably the most active Rangers youth policy um, since I've been going to to see Rangers, and that's ironic because you know you'd have thought the the third and second division would have been more of the time, but it just didn't pan out that way. Barry W. Richer asks, if you were the board and Mur- Murty doesn't finish the season well, who would you look to appoint as manager for next season? I think I've covered that one already. Now, uh, from Casa de Mule 84, what stand would you in- install stay standing in? Also, any chance of doing something like JRE fight cast for live games on TV? The current commentary standards are terrible. Well, firstly, no, because we don't have the rights to that. You can't just watch a game and do a commentary. Um, you need to buy the rights to do that and to put it out. So, no, um, that would be a, a non-starter. One of the ideas we had sort of toyed with was doing live commentaries to, as you say, kind of get rid of people having to listen to likes of Butcher and something. But it's a legal minefield to do that. Um, one of the things we can possibly look at doing is maybe just recording ourselves as we chat and, and putting it out as a watch along. That's okay, but if you are broadcasting at the same time as rights holders and they complain, then you are, um, how can I put this without swearing? I can't. Fucked. Um, and trust me, TV companies have got more money than me when it comes to legal action, so no, it's an absolute non-starter. What stand would you install safe, uh, safe standing in? I would assume it would be the Brimlin. Um would probably be, be the one or maybe the enclosure, but then you've got a lot of season ticket holders in the enclosure who I think would be loath to be moved out of there. It's a special place. Um, and I, I don't necessarily see people in there wanting to wanting to give up their seats. And that's always a, the issue with safe standing, that you've got people who vehemently believe in it and people who are vehemently against it. And I think that especially has to be taken into account at Rangers because of the Ibrox disaster and because of the way that we led the way into all-seated stadiums long before Hillsborough, long before the Taylor reports. Um, uh, it's an emotional argument for a lot of older bears and one that I respect 100% that the stadium is a monument to those people and should be kept as as safe as possible I think they have a visceral reaction I've spoken to some older bears about it and and they just have a visceral reaction to the concept of standing even safe standing which by its very nature is designed to eliminate any risk I I have no strong feelings on it one way or another I'd be happy to go with the majority on this one to be honest if it's something that the club and the support feel in the majority is something that should be pursued then Yep, pursue it. No complaints out of me. Equally, if it's something that is felt actually no for for a number of reasons, we're not going to do it. Then that, I'm fine with that as well. Uh, I'm I'm too old for it. I wouldn't be doing it. Um, uh, I, I I have a bad back, as I'm sure you all know. I mention it often enough. So uh, no, standing's not really an option for me, even if I wanted to. Um, provided I want to walk the next day. So it would be a decision. I think that I wouldn't be someone who played an active part in but yeah I mean if you were going to put it anywhere I would I would think probably the, the Brimlin would be be the one that that springs to mind Casa de Mille 84 also asks was there ever a chance of Rangers signing Jardel? Well, it was more than a chance he was here, he was training um, if you look online you'll find pictures of him in a rather natty mid 90s blue and black training gear um, and there was the Comment, possibly apocryphal, from Archie Knox that the reason Rangers decided not to sign him was that he couldn't trap a bag of cement in training, um, which looked unlikely considering a year later he was kind of wandering through that brilliant AC Milan defence for Porto and rattling in goals. So, yeah, Rangers, the deal was all agreed. It was, you know, pen pen to paper was, was all that was required. He was here, he was good to go. Then we were told there was a hold up with work permits. We were told there were a hold up with something else, uh, some technical aspects of the contract. And, and back then, even now, journalists aren't going to get too hung up on what that is. They're just going to report the deals in the balance. And then 
it was done and never to be reinvestigated. Although, you obviously, Jardell lived on through the Karen Jardell Loyal, named after his wife. And if you Google her, you'll find out why. And uh, it was, I think he, he he was a case of one that got away. Now, you never know with him because he had patches where, in his career, if you look at his career overall, it's, it's quite a weird career. He had patches where he was sensational and he had patches where he was rotten. But if Rangers had gone to all the trouble of scouting him, bringing him over, and then not signing him based on one training session, I think that would be a bit nuts. But at that time, I think he would have been a brilliant signing, however long it would have lasted. I mean, I mean it might have been a Negri-esque run of six amazing months and then problems setting in, or it could have been two years or whatever, or a year, and then he was off to a bigger league, you don't know. But he was... He was just utterly sensational for Porto, but Rangers, for some reason, didn't get the deal done. I don't think it was couldn't. I think it was didn't. And, uh, yeah, he's he goes into the, the category of one who got away because I think he could well have been uh, been an excellent player for us. Dugsy72 asks, Allowing for time travel, if you could have attended any Scottish Cup final, which would you choose and why? I think the Centenary Cup final with um, Tom Forsyth scoring that that magnificent winner um, from from all those inches out would be the one. It just looks amazing from the footage I've seen. It was obviously such an important match for Rangers. It was against Celtic. Um, the, the footage I've seen, the game itself looks like it was an absolute cracker. The atmosphere was amazing. I'd love to have, have been in the old Hamden when it was like that. I did get to go to the old Hamden in the 80s um, where it was, in all honesty, a bit of a shithole by that stage. So I wonder if it was any better. Maybe some bears who, who visited it regularly in the 70s can let me know about whether or not it was a nicer place to visit back then. But yeah, I'd like to have gone to that one. And then the 76 Cup final against Hearts I'd like to have gone to because that's famous for Derek Johnson scoring before the game kicked off because the game kicked off a, a couple of minutes before three, which would have pissed you off if you were late or just arrived bang on time. And he actually scored before it was three o'clock that day. So uh, allowing for time travel, those would be my Scottish Cup final picks. Well, that's a good question. He also asks, if you could bring back anything from the 70s or 80s to games, what would it be? Davy Crockett hats are out, though. Well, I'm not that old, but I remember the 70s, you know. I was, I was born in 77, so uh, I can't really comment on, on what I would bring back from the from the 70s. Um from the 80s, what would I bring back? The kits, first of all. The kits were fantastic. Just go honestly, go and look at kits from the mid-80s. They are the best football kits ever. Um, and not just us. You know, a, a lot of teams had absolutely cracking strips. The greatest Rangers strip of all time is the 1986 C.R. Smith uh, top, uh, as worn by Graham Soonis magnificently. And I absolutely adored that strip. And then the rest of the decade, we had, we had great strips as well. Um, bring some back from the 80s to games Soonis. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him back. Uh, that would that would be ideal. Being able to sing without getting lifted, that would be nice um, as well. I also like the thing we used to do when everybody would grab their scarf and twirl it. And it looked amazing on the TV. You'd see like thousands and thousands of bears doing it. It looked absolutely amazing on TV. And then when I first saw it at the game, I was just a wee boy and it just blew my mind. I thought that was fantastic. And then the food, because the food wasn't much cop, but nor was it 300 quid for uh, a burger that has never been anywhere near a cow as it currently is. So I think those would be my, my kind of main takeouts. Uh, from the 80s to, to deliver into now. That and Rangers, you know, being by far and away the best team. Um, I look forward to that. And the return of uh, VHS videos called things like That Championship Season. I think we would all like to like to hear them back as Doogie Donnelly or Bill McFarlane takes us through a very enjoyable season where we've just swept everyone aside and humped them. You and RFC 83, do you believe Mark Allen will be allowed a bigger influence and choice of a new manager after his success in the transfer window? Was he outvoted when we decided on McInnes? Uh, Mark Allen submitted a list to Rangers two days after Pedro's departure and Derek McInnes wasn't on that of managers that he felt would be right for the job and that's not me giving you any inside info. He said that to the papers and was quoted, so was clearly allowed 
to or allowed his name to go forward. He clearly didn't just do it on deep background, as reporters call it. He he was quite happy to distance himself, I think, from the utter shambles that was the Rangers managerial search. And I don't think he was particularly enamoured with the choice of McInnes, no. And I don't think McInnes was particularly enamoured of having to work under a director of football either. Um, so I'm not sure that relationship would have would have worked quite so well. There was a sea change. I think everyone can see it. I don't think, again, I'm revealing any secrets. That from round about sort of mid-December, almost when Graham Murty was given um, the job to the end of the season, the board who had been very hands-on in football matters, stepped back a little and allowed Mark Allen to to get on with his job. And I think he did have a good transfer window and I think impressed a lot of people uh, around the club by his dealings. Um, and to be honest, you either have to let the guy do the job or you have to fire him. This halfway house that, that the board were trying, sort of October-ish, which was... Yeah, he's the director of football, but we still want to check everything and make all the decisions. That was never going to work. You know, either back the guy or sack the guy. And they appear to have decided to back him. So do I think he'll have a bigger input this time? I I think so, and I would hope so, because he has to work with the person. And clearly they have to share a vision of how they want to play football, the type of players that they want. I think it's quite clear that Mark Allen and Graham Marty do. It's quite clear that they have a good relationship. So if another manager was coming in, then you would have to uh, hope that it would be someone who, again, Mark Allen felt he could work well with and dovetail well with. Uh, the, the problem you can often have in football is that you can't always see the logic in decision-making. I'll give you a recent example. Everton, who, as some of you might know, a team I have a fondness for, and they went for Marco Silva, the Watford manager at the time, and he was the guy they wanted to replace Ronald Koeman. And they didn't get him, and then they went to Sam Allardyce. Now, that is completely different. So what was it about Marco Silva that attracted you? Was it the style of play? Was it his his youth? Was it his contacts abroad? Okay, well, you've gone from that to pretty much 180-degree opposite in Sam Allardyce. So what was the decision-making process? Was it just hire somebody, a manager, uh, and that's what it looks like. It looks like it was scattered gun. There was no thought to what the long term ramifications of signing that manager would be. It was just we need a manager, he's a manager, we'll pick him. Or oh, we didn't get him right, we'll pick another manager, he's a manager, we'll pick him. And I don't want Rangers to, to do that. I would like Rangers to have someone in mind because he represents things that the club want to see, be it a playing style be it a management style, be it, as I say, contacts abroad, be it his record in youth development, whatever it is. And I think if you then go from someone who ticks a lot of boxes to someone who ticks a completely different set of boxes, it doesn't show you any joined up thinking. But if you've got a director of football, technical director, whatever you want to call it, we call it a director of football, they head the football department. So you have to let them head the football department. Otherwise, there's not an awful lot of point having them. It's a bit of a waste of a wage. So I think the board have backed off a little. Um, look, any of you who've worked uh, for a company will know that the management will never completely back off. They'll always be sort of, what's going on here then? So I think football clubs are the same and realistically you would expect them to, you would expect them to do so. But I think that they have learned their lesson slightly in terms of look, what we were doing wasn't working. We might as well try the other thing, which would be allow Mark Allen to get on with the job. Because if Mark Allen fails, then that's one thing. But if Mark Allen isn't allowed to succeed, that's a completely different. And I think that the board have appreciated that. And I think you saw that with the results of the, the transfer window. Uh, Kiki Mylari okay, asks, David, do you think any staff at Rangers FC listen to the Heart and Hand podcast? And do you think they'd be wise or foolish to do so? Yes, I know that some of them listen to the Heart and Hand podcast. And I think they'd be wise to, um, because I like to think it's quite entertaining, and I hope they enjoy it. Um, do I think it influences anyone? 
it's not for me to say it's not what we try to do um if you notice with heart and hand we don't get involved in campaigns and that's very deliberate um it, it's not something i want us to do we i've done that before and i think that the ranger support have uh, had enough of my proselytizing and had enough of me telling them what they should do and that was a younger version of me who was arrogant enough to believe that uh, I had the ability to do that when I didn't <laughs> and uh, as you can see by the fact that the stuff I was trying to prevent happening happened anyway so um, I, I like us to comment on things absolutely that's you know the job it's just a group of fans talking about the club that's what this show is so that won't change but in terms of you know do i hope that we have influence in the corridor no god no, no no interest in that sort of thing at all um i'd like people to listen to this and enjoy it for what it is um to agree with the points they agree with uh, with and to dis- disagree with the points they they disagree with um politely well you know remember we're all rangers fans um that is is always a strange one. You get these really antagonistic posts from people, and they're like, mate, it's just my opinion. You know, don't get so hit up. I'm just a bloke who has a different opinion to you. But I know that there are people at the club who listen to it. Yes, do I think players should listen to it? Um, I don't. I don't think it would do them any harm. I think they would enjoy it. But uh, I can understand why they wouldn't. I don't know if I would listen to a podcast that described the performance of my podcast every week. I'm sure there's a Celtic podcast out there that reviews it on a weekly basis. There's certainly a website that reviews all my fa- uh, all my YouTube videos. Genuinely, there is a Timmy video blog. I think that reviews um, that. So I dare say they review the content as well as the podcast. But uh, yeah, so they do, and I have a decent relationship with people who work at the club. Uh, I have no relationship with other people who work at the club, and I think that's kind of how it should be. Um, I, I did that video for RTV a few months ago. I enjoyed doing it. I was honoured to be asked. It was it was fun. It was done. They didn't ask anything of me other than to do that, and I didn't offer anything back either, and that's the kind of relationship I want with the club. I don't want to be beholden to them. Um, I don't want to, as I say, that's why the club know not to kind of come to me. When I was in the trust, if the club said, can you help us with this? Absolutely, I would go and do it. Now, it's not something I want to do, unless it's something obvious like, you know, Rangers Youth Development, where it's quite clearly a good thing, then of course, you know, that that's not a problem. But I don't really want to be a shill for the club either because you need to retain the critical aspect. And I think it just works better if there is a distance you know between and and that's that's ideal for me because then i can say what i like it has no reflection or impact on the club if i say something uh, that, that people find troublesome which as you may have noticed this season happens from time to time then it doesn't have any uh, none of that splatters onto the club and equally if the club does stuff that the fans don't like then i don't get guilted by association either um and i'd rather that people judged and liked or disliked this based on what it is rather than what people um, might associate it being. So, uh, yeah, that that that's the thing. Although, as I said, I've long campaigned for just once to let me do the pre-match announcement against the Sheep of the Tims. Just once, right? Let me do the... Give me the mic and let me do the tannoy uh, in one of those games. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that you guys would crowdfund for my legal team but trust me it would be worth it I mean I'd have to shut it down after it but it would be worth it trust me uh, Ian Smooch asks if everyone was fit what's your, ele- your first 11 for me in a 4-2-3-1 Wes, Tav, Elton, Bates, McCrory, Jack, Goss, Doherty, Dorans, Murphy, Alfie uh, that's a good side that's a really good side um, I think Though I would make a slight, I would also go with a four five one four three three would probably be be my formation, and it would be Wes Tav Elton Bates, <sighs> McCrory in midfield. Or, yeah, McCrory at centre half. Uh, I think midfield three of Jack Goss and Doherty. 
And then I would go with uh, Candace Murphy on the flanks and Alfie up front. And I know people will be going, no, Josh Windass, you hate Josh Windass. I really don't. Um, there would be games that I would change that formation and Josh Windass would play, um, particularly in away matches where I think he's really useful. But if if we're picking the side for, I assume, you know, the biggest games, then I like the three in midfield. And I feel that recently, I think we all feel it recently in these games that we've kind of struggled by not having that extra body in the middle of the park. And I think that would combat it. Dugsy72, what is your favourite kit of all time other than a Rangers one? That is a bloody good question. Um, thank you for that one. That's a cracker. I liked the Scotland Mexico eighty six one. I thought that was a belting kit and the away one, the yellow one of that, because I I love strips where the away strip is just the home strip but in a different colour. I think that's better. that appeals to the OCD in me, and I I really like that. And much as I loved the Rangers eighty three eighty four kit with the blue one and the white one, same reason. I think that's brilliant. Love that. Um. Uh, in terms of other kits from back then, Everton's kits all through the the eighties were cracking. Really, really liked them. Juventus mid nineties, the Sony kit when they played us, uh, that was an absolute classic. Kappa, uh, I believe, made that one. Um, I had a long sleeve version of it. It was an absolutely superb strip. Um, Barcelona in the eighties had a cracking strip that I really liked. Um, that I had when I was a kid. Liverpool, actually, um, although I'm not a huge Liverpool fan, Liverpool's kits, the the one they won the European Cup with in 84, uh, I thought was a cracker. Uh, and I liked the Manchester United one back then as well, the sharp one with a badge in the middle. Um, I thought that was a, a really good kit as well. So, yeah, 80s boy, definitely, when it, comes to, when it comes to kits. I did think the Germany one at the last World Cup was an absolute topper, though. Uh, so simple, really classy. Thought it was real top drawer kit. And of course, you cannot not pick possibly the greatest non Rangers strip of all time, which is the Diego Maradona Napoli 1985 86 kit. It's a, a storm, other one with Mars Bar. Um, Napoli's kits now is completely sponsor fucked. You can't actually see their team colours under all the sponsors. And. Uh, uh, it's a real shame, but that one is a beauty. I actually saw an original for sale on Classic Football Kits, and it was like three hundred and ninety nine. I thought, no, I can't justify that four hundred quid for a for a, a a football top. How would you like to see Rangers celebrate our one hundred and fiftieth anniversary? Oh, that's a belter um, with a league title, with a treble, uh, some sort of European success that year would be nice. Um, I think we have to make a huge thing of it. The Ibrox match, the experience, isn't much cop, really. So I think that you need to commemorative strip, possibly the Gallant Pioneers um, kit could be a version of it, could be released that year. You need to have loads of special events commemorating it, um, culminating in a massive dinner. Uh, There should be big in-stadium extra events, I feel, almost like rallies like they used to have. Uh, I think that sort of thing would be great where people from throughout our history could could come along, uh, not Ian Black, and uh, the crowd would get a chance to to say uh, thank you to, to everyone who was involved in it. Um, I think there, there obviously will be things like uh, films released about it. Um, hell, who knows? If Patreon goes well, I'll make the bloody film um, about it. Um, which would take it from an exempt rating, I think, to needing a classification. But still, uh, there's so many things, and I really hope we push the boat out. And if the team is good at the time and winning as well, then that would just sweeten the deal. What formation would you like to see Rangers line up in the semi-final versus them? Uh, like I say, four-three-three, four-five-one, and we need an extra body in midfield in that game. And yes, again, that means we would draw Windass because I think that you have to. Um, have a striker up front then who can work the defenders to play that system and I think that Morello showed in that match that he can do that even though obviously he's, he's finishing against Celtic has been um, a letdown for him this season but he, he bullied their defenders for the first 70 minutes of that match and in that formation I think you can do it um, you can argue then you're losing a goal threat and you are correct but I think that we have others in the team who are capable and Candace Murphy Morelos, 
you know, let's not write the guy off because he's he's missed a couple of bad chances. Um, so yeah, that would be me. A, a four three three that goes into a four five one when we don't have the ball. And I think with Candace and Murphy, you've got players who are intelligent enough to do that. I think if you can get a whole midfielder in, um, that that frees up. But I think Graham Dorans will be back, so I think that the extra body in midfield, especially such a skillful one as him, would be very useful. RFC eighteen seventy two. Looking ahead to next season, do you think Ross McCrory is more likely to be considered a centre half or a holding midfielder? That's a brilliant question, and the honest answer is, is I don't know. I think it will come down to whoever is the manager and what formation he wants to play. I'm not sure I know which one's his best position, and that's a compliment that he looked good, really good as a defender. Then he went into midfield and looked like he was born to play there. So I don't know. Um, it's a nice problem to have, though, isn't it? Uh, Ross McCrory, he's he's just really good, <laughs> and he's just yeah, the, the world's at his feet because he is resilient. He's strong. He's reasonably quick. He's good in the air. He can tackle. He snaps into a tackle as well. It's not he tackles because you know he has to. He, he's one of these guys that loves a tackle. Um, and I know that if you went to a live show at the Loudon Tavern with Kevin Thompson, um, Kev was absolutely raving about him because he loves to see that in a midfielder. And he says it's it's not something that you can teach boys that they either, you know, you can kind of teach them that they have to tackle and how to tackle. But the ones that, that really want to do it, and he said it's the way they go in, they go in with that snap and they go in with a crispness and he does that. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him change about quite regularly depending on injuries, depending on formation, depending on who we're playing and what a valuable weapon that is to have, that you've got someone who can do that and can be trusted in those two key positions. Uh, Huge, huge fan of Ross McCrory and uh, I think the world's his oyster. RFC 1872 uh, similar question rather than positions what attributes do you think we need to add to the team leadership obviously but to me someone who can shoot from range would give us another option to break down teams that sit deep yes yes uh, I agree with that I think someone who can take a man on and uh, you know has if you like a very old fashioned word but the ability to beat a man with dribbling um, is always useful when you're up against a packed defence because these are the guys that can change uh, it can change a game because they can get through the lines. When when teams know that all they have to do is set up and mark their space and that'll be enough uh, if they do it well, then the guy who is the X factor that can bring something a little different to the party is always useful. The guy that can go past a man is always useful, but they don't grow in trees, unfortunately. Uh, I wish they did. But a guy like that would be would be hugely beneficial to us. Uh, leadership, you nailed, is a key thing for us. The type of guy that when things aren't going well, and remember this is recording, you know, just after that abysmal command display where we completely lacked that, and then I thought in the last twenty minutes looked like a beaten team. Someone who can then, through his either his personality or his displays, can raise the the rest of the team. And I think it was Andy that said on the pod, someone who the rest of the guys then look at and go, we're going to be all right, he's there, I trust him. Uh, I don't think it's just about shouting at people. I don't think it's just about moaning at people because I think that if guys are in their shell, you know, shouting and moaning is, is quite often counterproductive because all it does is just shove them further in there. And... I think that, I mean, you're always after somebody that can hit a shot from distance and trouble a keeper because it pushes defenders back and it makes them think differently. Um, and it just really, uh, when Alberts was there, he had that shot. So defenders, you could quite often see, leave their man, in fact, actually, and, and go and push up on him and he would just slip the pass in behind quite often. And it's it's it just gets a bit of, what's the word? It just puts a bit of doubt in defenders mind and that's what we lack at the moment that I think that teams think that they know what we're going to do and then it's either are they good enough to stop us and some of the teams in Scotland aren't and that's why we're putting them away and then there are teams that are and they have stopped us uh, so it's it's about getting that, that balance and having somebody who can do something a little different when teams are 
are uh, saying to us, you know, we're comfortable with what you're doing. What's your other thing? If we've got guys who we can say, well, here's plan B, for want of a better term, and then that's useful. Barhead B. Due to the pod, I've been watching loads of old footage. Where do you rate Ronald De Boer's time at Ibrox? Always liked him, but watching the 2 3 season, his contribution was outstanding. You are absolutely correct. I loved Ronald De Boer. I couldn't believe we'd signed Ronald De Boer. He was one of my favourite players. And then he, he pitches up at Ibrox. You know, can you imagine? I was just so happy. And he wasn't fit at first. He clearly wasn't. And it was a bad time to arrive, the 2000-2001 the, the season when Rangers were collapsing. And he just didn't really look like the guy that we thought. And having had you know, Jonas Tern, for example, uh, recently we thought, oh, here we go, another guy who's just here to top up his pension. Wonderful. And ironically enough, it was Alex McLeish and not Dick Advocat who ended up getting the best out of them. And part of that might have been fitness. But I think Alex McLeish was savvy enough. Uh, he gets a lot of criticism, Eck, but he was savvy enough to realise this is a special guy. I need to adapt my team around him, whereas I think Dick had just sort of put him in the side. And Dick was at the trying anything stage by then, to be honest. Whereas I think McLeish went, right, I've got to figure out a way to get the best out of this guy. And the position he allowed him to play did that. That season, he was superb. He was absolutely wonderful to watch. Uh, he just had a touch of class that you don't see in Scotland very often. Uh, his ability in the ball was, was superb. He was sublime at just taking the ball out of the air. And for younger bears who might not remember him that clearly if you remember maybe Dimitar Berbatov he was like that that you could hit a ball up to him pretty much at any angle and he would just kill it and bring it down without really needing to think about it you see that a lot with Scottish players that they're so busy thinking about controlling the ball they don't look up and see a pass he looked up um, because he could because he knew his control wouldn't let him down and it didn't and I loved watching him that season I thought he had a brilliant season next to Barry Ferguson incidentally who had what I still consider to be the greatest individual season I've ever seen from a Rangers player. And yes, that includes Loudrup. And yes, that includes Gascoigne. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. But Barry Ferguson was just magnificent that season. And I'm not his biggest fan. But you, you cannot in any way, I think, deny his contribution to that team. And what he brought to the side. He brought leadership. He brought goals. He brought determination. He galvanised the side. He wouldn't accept defeat. He was just a, a, a fabulous midfielder. And De Boer next to him, uh, uh, in that level, if you like, he would be he would have been my second player of the year behind him. Brian McCulloch. What do you think needs to change most for us to begin to get back to where we should be? For me, we are far too nice. Probably the nicest team in the league. We need to sign a centre-half and centre midfield that can play and can mix it. I think, yeah, that, that there's a balance between being able to battle and being able to to play football. Um, it's difficult for anyone who's going to come in to manage at Rangers because we are just so starved of success and so desperate for it that we're impatient. And, you know, Graham Murray, for example, has only really had a couple of months as a manager and, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, you know, but already we're saying, nah, he's, he's maybe not got it. But it's just because we're so desperate to, to see silverware again and to get us back to, to where we where we belong. I think we need, uh, as you say, we need leaders, characters. We need guys who can go, okay, this is a battle for 20 minutes, that's fine, we'll win this battle and then we'll play our football again. And good Rangers teams in the past have always had that. Um, and I think it's important to try and rediscover that because I, I hate you know saying anything remotely positive about that lot, but when they went down to 10 men, then their belief in themselves and their ability to kind of battle it out was what got them through it and we don't have that at the moment as we've proved in the last two games is it something that players can discover I don't know that's you know that people who've played the game will know that more than I will if it's something you either have or you need to bring in players who have it already um, but yeah we are far too nice on and off the park and um, we need to uh, we need to remember that we are the scalp everyone wants and uh, try and do something based on that. 
Ross Armour, 346. If all of Dorans, Doherty, McCrory, Jack, Goss, Windass are fit, who is our best midfield? And would it be a central two or a three? It would be a three. And for me, if everyone was fit and we trusted the centre backs, I'm very excited about a midfield of Doherty, McCrory, and Goss. I think that midfield contains a tackler, a ball winner, a general, uh, a passer, who I think would thrive with a bit a little less responsibility to do that other part of the game and a box-to-box midfielder. So I think that you've got everything you need in a three-man midfield with those three. But as I say, a lot of that depends on getting everyone fit, Sean Goss being still here, and uh, us trusting the centre-back so Ross McCrory doesn't have to go back there. CRM Pickle, uh, given the suspected mentality issue in the Ibrox squad, do you think a better manager can instill a stronger mentality in the current playing squad or are the players incapable of turning around their weak mentality? I think a new manager will probably ship out the ones who are incapable of um, becoming stronger mentally and becoming more disciplined. I think that you will see that over the next... Uh, transfer window they all looked at all managers look to bring in leaders that's what Bruno Alves was signed for that was Pedro's attempt at bringing in a leader uh, and obviously it hasn't worked out Mark Allen tried it with Barton and, and Clint Hill to an extent and no doubt a new manager will try it I even think the Rangers have tried it a little bit with Russell Martin this time and maybe we will have to import it because I think that a lot of these guys are a little fragile and like I said on the pod on Monday, the thing that really gutted me about Saturday was that it only took one bump in the road, which was the defeat to Celtic, which while it was disappointing, it wasn't like they'd be beaten 5 or 6 nil or anything. It was just a game they should have won and they didn't win. And yet they couldn't rebound at all in a week from that, and that worries me. And it's a shame because there's good players there, but if they don't have the mentality to play for Rangers, then they won't be able to play for Rangers. The phrase, the shirt's too big for them, isn't unique to us. I've heard Manchester United fans say it. I've heard Liverpool fans say it. It's because there are certain clubs where, rightly or wrongly, there is a a level of expectation and the fans ain't going to change. So you either can do it or you can't. And at the moment, too many of ours can't, unfortunately. Power Ranger 1872. Obviously, without the benefit of hindsight, in 1986, if you had to choose between Ian Durant and Derek Ferguson, which one would you have gone for? Fucking hell, that is a question and a half. Oh, wow. Obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, it's an easy an easy answer, but... Oh, at the time, I really liked Derek Ferguson. Bearing in mind I was eight, I really liked Derek Ferguson... Um, I thought he was really classy and elegant and I liked Ian Durant but I liked at that age and, and probably even now guys who could pass the ball and Derek Ferguson could do that so 8 year old me probably wrongly I think I preferred Derek Ferguson but I'd like to have that problem now and with it, with hindsight one you know, pissed away his career um, and his talent and never made what he should have made of himself whereas one had it robbed from him but uh, an excellent question. What did you guys think? Uh, Bears were a bit older than me and knew football better back then. Who who was your pick back then? Uh, I'd love to hear that. Let me know. Wingman619. Who would be your all-time Jails Survivor Series team? Five hard bastards. John Gregg. Tam Forsyth. Graham Soonis. Bomber and Richard Goff. I'd take that five in a scrap um, with me. Be quite, you don't really need soonest, but yeah, that five I think would take some would take some stopping. Scott Wilson, a personal question, David, if you don't mind. Ah, I know you said on the pod that you accept that you are mental. Is this a direct result of your time in the RST or did you have your foibles before then? Um, I don't think... It was entirely all the fault of the RSC. You no, know, I've always been somewhat odd. Um, but I'm charming. I get by. People like me. Um, but yeah, things like the, you know, ha- clothes all have to match, including watch, shoes, belt, underwear, jacket, hat, scarf. Yeah, that's, I accept, a little odd. The hoarding of cleaning products. 
hoarding of all products actually that I like. If I like something, I'll buy multiples of them. Like the reason Alexas keep going off in my uh, in my room when I'm recording is that there's four of them in here. Um, because if I like something, I'll buy it. It's why I own 18 pairs of headphones. I go through obsessions, and if I get into something, I really get into it for a while, and then I'll kind of go, you know, back to normal on it, and as something else takes its place. But uh, no, I think I've just always been a bit, you know, the Howard Hughes thing. Um, it's not done for effect. I'm just perfectly happy in the house with my wife and my dogs. And I love all my friends, but I'd be perfectly happy to you know, never see another human in my life. Uh, and still communicate with them all through the medium of text, not phone. But I, I would be perfectly happy to literally never leave the house again. And uh, <laughs> people think that, that I'm going to be doing that for effect. I'm really not. Um, if I could find a way to just, um, you know, like, like, like time... Um, you know, wiggle my nose and arrive in my seat at Ibrox and wiggle my nose and get back. That would literally be my only trips out of the house, if uh, if at all possible. It's just, you know, who I am. I'm just a uh, slightly what... You need to remember that, with all, all joking aside, you know, 25 years of putting in the amount of mind-altering chemicals and, and booze that I've put in my system, uh, I think I'm lucky that I got away with just being a bit mental. Um, I've seen guys come away with a lot worse, put it that way. Graham Roy, the infamous Podders WhatsApp group. Who is the guy that sends the most dodgy videos that you have to think about forwarding in case they are illegal? My guess is either Hoggy or Scott. Well, actually, I don't really like people sending me videos. Um, I think it's rude because they last for like, you know, two or three minutes. And I'm, how dare you demand that I take two or three minutes time out of my life to watch this? I find it very rude. I don't do it myself. And because of the spirit of compromise inherent within me, I don't let them send videos on the WhatsApp group. So that kind of kills that. There's a brilliant uh, Onion, for those of you who read The Onion, the satirical newspaper, there's a brilliant Onion headline uh, for an article that says, co-worker who sent eight-minute video must be out of his fucking mind. And uh, that's that's kind of how I feel when people send videos. It's like, really? Uh, and that's why it took me so long to do the Facebook videos and the YouTube videos, because I, I don't watch them, so I just sort of assumed nobody did. And then if people started to ask me for them, and yeah, I'm always happy to, to do stuff if people want it. But otherwise, it's like, you know, why? Why would you do that? And that that's maybe just me. Um, but I, I never claim to be playing with a full deck, people. Okay, doke, folks, that is all our questions for today's International Week Q&A. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you to our sponsors, Maitland & Co. Uh, for all your legal needs, visit maitlandandco.net. Also remember that we are soon to be announcing tickets for our live date with Clint Hill on the 8th of June at the Loudoun Tavern in Glasgow, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, there will also be, because we've changed the date, so there will be some returns, there will also be some tickets, a very limited amount of tickets, but some going on sale for the Kevin Thompson night on May the 11th in Dunfermline at the British Legion Hall. Uh, with all that, you can support the podcast by joining us on the Patreon subscription site. It's one ninety nine per month. Um, we promise it to start 20 to 25 hours of extra content a month. You get that in a week. You get that in a week. And you don't have to listen to all of it, incidentally. You can just pick and choose the ones you want to listen to. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. So please visit patreon.co.com uh, even forward slash heart and hand. Have a look, try before you buy, and see what you think about it. And uh, you can, of course, buy the summer's must-have fashion accessory, the Heart and Hand t-shirt, by visiting heartandhand.co.uk. Right, I think I've shilled enough to you a lot. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I will be back on Monday with the next pod. Till then, take care. Bye.